Oh, good. Woohoo! All right, talk over. Uh, I'm Chris Broadfoot. I work at Google in San Francisco. Uh, I work on Go and our cloud platform, and mostly the intersection of those two. Um, so before I start, my mother's been asking me, when am I going to do a talk that's being recorded? So hello, mother. I uh, hope you enjoy this. Um, you can probably stop now. It's going to be uh, rubbish from here, I think, for you, <laughs> but good for everybody else. OK, so I'm going to talk about why you should write your own web framework. And uh, this is a bit of a, a, a weird title, because um, you'll see I, I'm not a big fan of web frameworks, and I'll talk about why. Um, so before we go into that, I think it's useful to talk about why people use web frameworks. Um, I think the main thing is people are comfortable with that. When they come to Go, they say, oh, what's the equivalent to Ruby on Rails, or something like that, right? People feel as though they need to use a web framework. Um, I think as you write more and more web servers in Go, you realize that that isn't the case. I think the second big reason is to reduce boilerplate. Um, and again, in Go, there isn't very much boilerplate to write web servers. Uh, the net HTTP package is pretty well featured and can handle most, uh, most workloads, I think. Um, you also get out-of-the-box features like uh, request logging and things like that. So in preparation for this talk, I took a quick uh, review of some popular Go web frameworks. Um, and, I felt, uh, and I found that many are monolithic, so they have a lot of, a lot of features. Um, you know, they handle everything from middleware to routing to um, you know, having custom handler types that have context types that do all sorts of things. Um, I think, in general, they're over-generalized. Um, and this makes sense for frameworks, right? You, you kind of need to cover everybody's use cases. Um, if someone doesn't have a particular feature, uh, then they might dismiss the whole framework. Uh, so in order to be appealing to everyone, they need to put everything in there. Um, a lot, some of them enforce a model of programming, like MVC. Um, that might be your thing, um, but again, it might not be. Um, and I, I didn't really want to say this, but a bunch of them have code quality issues. Uh, I think something that you're doing if you choose to use a web framework is to see exactly what the code is doing. So go in there and have a look at the, the code that your framework is running. Um, and they also introduce a sense of lock-in. Um, often, if they have a lot of custom types and ways of doing things, it makes it difficult to move to another framework. So what's the solution? Oh, uh, still going. <laughs> Let's turn that off. Um, so what's the solution? Uh, do it yourself. Uh, but I think don't do it all yourself. So for example, uh, routing is something that might be difficult to write yourself. Um, if you need to do things like uh, you know, marks based on methods or pull things out of the request path. Um, so I suggest you check out one of these packages. Um, I have a star next to the last one because it's, um, it's, it's pretty good and um, high performance, um, but it only has one method that uses the net HTTP handler type. Um, otherwise, it basically has its own handler type. So it makes it difficult to use with your existing web handlers if you wanted to slot this into your existing application. So um, I think Andrew wrote this post, Error Handling and Go, um, quite a few years ago now. And he introduces this, this concept of um, a different handler type. So in this case, it's similar to the net HTTP handler, but returns an error. Basically, if your handler code returns an error, then um, then it'll handle it for you. And in this case, it just uh, uh, calls HTTP.error. But basically, all this does is replaces if err, not nil, handle error, you know, you have this helper function, and replaces it with return err, which is kind of nice. Sometimes it's easy to um, miss the return after handle error. Um, but yeah, it really doesn't do that much. Um, the same post then goes on to introduce a struct type, um, which lets you do things like specify the error code, uh, the HTTP status code, and maybe a message to log or something like that. Um, so for example, you might want to uh, log the details of the error to an internal log, but present the, a different message to the user. So when writing, <clears throat> when writing a bunch of servers, I um, extended this concept to not only return the, an error as a struct, but also have my response as a struct. Um, and so this basically becomes a union type. So there's either an error or a bunch of different fields specific to my application. And 
uh, and the handler knows how to render it, right? Up here. So uh, survey HTTP now calls it and then chooses how to render the result. Um, probably JSON or something like that, depending on your application. Um, so all of these things lead to a pretty annoying repetition when you're setting up your handlers. Um, this is actually code from uh, one of my sample applications. Um, so you see this app handler over and over and over again. Um, and this is, this is kind of a problem because the, the handlers no longer know how to render themselves, right? They need, uh, they need that app handler type. Um, so what you can do is move the common rendering somewhere else, like a, a write to um, method on, on your response type. Um, and so now the response knows how to render itself to a HTTP uh, response writer. Um, so here's an example of one I wrote. All of this code is up on GitHub, by the way. Um, so in this case, this one, this one renders JSON. Um, but yeah, there's other code that's, uh, that needs to be executed. Oh, I don't have slides anymore. Anyway, the rest of the slides are up on, uh, up on my GitHub. Um, yeah, sorry, the more interesting part actually was later, so that's unfortunate. <laughs> Thank you very yeah. much.